Billy, you're my husband and my co-host. Hi. Yes, I am. Welcome to the Mushroom (laughs) Miniseries. Learning about mushrooms. Learning about mushrooms. Learning about mushrooms, how they grow and what they do. Welcome to the Mushroom Miniseries on the Growing Joy Podcast. I'm Maria, and I'm obsessed with learning how mushrooms grow. And I'm Billy, Maria's husband, and I'm really excited to learn how we can use mushrooms to better our health and minds. Learning about mushrooms, learning about mushrooms. I'm so excited about what we are about to gift our listener community, aren't you, Billy? I'm really excited and honestly a little nervous as well. So sweet plant friends. So if you don't know, Billy is my husband. You might see him on our social media channels, but we're so excited. We have been working behind the scenes on bringing this amazing four-part mini-series exploring the incredible magical world of mushrooms. But maybe magical wasn't the right word to use because... These aren't magic mushrooms. We're exploring functional mushrooms for this four-part mini-series. Who knows in the future? <laughs> it's really been a passion project for me and Billy. And so when I pitched Billy on if he would be my co-host... I said yes. I was very, very nervous. But honestly, I thought it was a cool thing to talk about with a professional because we love this topic uh, ourselves. Like We come at it through two completely different perspectives. I'm looking more at the functionality of mushrooms, the adaptogenic nature of them, how I can use them for protocols in life. And you came at it through the genesis of mushrooms. How do they grow and how do they affect the plant kingdom and uh, so much more. So it really seemed like a great opportunity to be able to talk to an expert. And I was so excited, probably even a little too excited, but uh, I think it worked out pretty well. Yeah. So Billy and I have gotten into exploring mushrooms after watching an amazing movie called Fantastic Fungi by Paul Stamets. After watching that movie, we started going for walks in a local nature preserve and we would go like mushroom hunting and we would sing, you know, the theme song to this little mini series that we created is actually a little theme song that we hum to each other. (laughs) Shroomy, shroomy, shroom, shroomy, shroomy, shrooms. But we would like hum that dumb little song while we she were would hunting, do most of the humming while we were hunting for mushrooms. But you know, technically, as you'll <laughs> learn in this episode, you know, mushrooms are technically a different kingdom than plants, but they are a partner to plants, and there's so much to explore. And mm-hmm. I think, especially as mushrooms are being talked about more in society, we just thought it would be really fun to dig in and co-host something together. Yeah, I mean, it's part of popular culture now. It's uh, it's being talked about from you know scientists to enthusiasts to hobbyists and everything in between. And I found myself not really knowing the answers to some of these definitions and wanting to learn more because I think like any great hobby, it's only great if you do it at a thousand percent. So this is definitely yeah. a thousand percent the people that we found to get to talk about our new favorite hobby. And the fun thing is, you know, I started Growing Joy used to be called Bloom and Grow Radio as a complete plant novice, right? Like I didn't understand plants and I interviewed experts to learn how to care for them. And now I feel like you and I are back at almost episode one, Maria. Yeah. We're complete mushroom novices. We don't understand how they grow. We don't understand how they work. We don't really understand their benefits. But together as a team and together as a community with our listener community, we get to be the novices and partner with an incredible, incredible mushroom expert, Louis Giller from Norrisport. Shout out. We love you're about to get to know him really well. But Louis has spent almost a decade studying, growing, foraging, and most importantly, eating mushrooms. His mycological journey began at the University of Denver, where he's studied environmental science and conducted oyster mushroom research inspired by mycologist Paul Stamets. So you'll hear us talk about this, but we're like Paul Stamets fan boys and girls. So it's very exciting that that he knows him. So Louis works for an amazing company called North Spore. Billy and I were in a store the other day a while back and we saw one of North Spore's mushroom grow kits and we were so shocked. I mean, I talk about this in the episode a little bit, but we got to know North Spore's mission and commitment to teaching people about mushrooms. And when Billy and I were coming up with this idea for this mushroom mini series, we knew that we wanted a really vetted, equally as passionate, but way more of an expert as us to walk us through understanding mushrooms. And North Spore was kind of the answer to our prayers. And the beauty of North Spore is, you know, 
they've lent us Louie for this four part mushroom mini series, but we're going to be um, experimenting and trying the different grow techniques that Louie teaches. And Northpore has all of those products there. And not only that, but Louis is, you know, gifting us his incredible knowledge. If you guys are interested in learning and growing alongside us, you can use coupon code growing joy at Norspore.com to grow alongside us and use their products and figure out how to grow mushrooms and live our best shroomy lives. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's a big, a big topic, uh, the world of mushrooms and fungi. And honestly, it's really great to have sort of that group to that can help bring you through and show you the way. Uh, yeah, and Louis is such a nerd. He's such a plant nerd. And it's the best. I mean, he's so passionate, so knowledgeable and so generous with his knowledge yeah. too. Like, like I felt like we really came at him uh, with a lot of different questions from a lot of different angles yeah. and he just stood and kind of just fielded all of them really gracefully. And he was very, very kind uh, and just a blast to talk to. I hope to have a beer with him someday. He yeah. seems like a really cool guy. Great attitude that Louis. Yeah. So <laughs> this is going to be four episodes. Today's episode that you're hearing, the inaugural episode, is an exploration of mushrooms, what they are and what they do for us. Episode two will be how to grow mushrooms outdoors because you can actually grow them in your garden alongside your plants. Louis is going to teach us how to do that. Third episode is going to be how to grow mushrooms indoors, how we can grow them inside, which is I think what Billy and I are really excited about exploring. And then the fourth episode, we're going to save it as a surprise, but the fourth episode will be kind of a continuation of everything we've been learning. Louis, so amazing. This conversation was so rich. So, and the other thing I want to say is I'm so proud of Billy. This was his first interview. I think you did a really, really (laughs) good job. And I think, you know, Billy and I are a wonderful pair for this exploration of mushrooms because you are really committed to learning about mushrooms for functionality for humans. Mm -hmm. And I'm really curious about like mushrooms in general and like how they grow and what they are. So I think you asked a lot of questions that I wouldn't have asked and vice versa in this interview. And with that, I think we've got to just give them what they want. I think we've just got to get right to it, right? Yeah. I really hope that everybody enjoys and I'm really, really excited. Honestly, I feel very privileged to have been part of this. So this is really cool. And thanks for having me on. It's really, really awesome. (laughs) My dream. Welcome to Growing Joy. We are too excited about this conversation. Yeah, I'm looking forward to this like literally <laughs> since we talked about it. I'm happy to be here. It's very <laughs> cool. I love that you reached out and that we were able to connect in this way and reach people who are interested in learning about mushrooms. Sober curious and mushroom curious. So this is for the mushroom curious. You are the mushroom expert and part of an incredible mushroom company. Before we dive into the list of questions that Billy and I have prepared for you, we're about to interrogate you about shroomies. (laughs) Can you give a little introduction of how you became the mushroom man that you are today? Sure. The origin story. I went to college at the University of Denver and uh, I majored in environmental science. I took a class with really, really cool professor, Mr. Quigley. Hopefully he's out there. Professor Dr. Quigley. Excuse me. <laughs> Hopefully he's still out there doing his thing. But he was really stoked to sponsor student research. And a buddy of mine had read a book by Paul Stamets called Mycelium Running showed it to me and said, hey, we should, you know, take advantage of some of the department's money, read this book, and we'll apply to recreate some of the research. So we did and got some money and we went and collected mine runoff in Colorado and tested oyster mushrooms for their ability to pull heavy metals out of substrate that had been soaked in that very contaminated runoff. And it worked. And I learned a bunch along the way, read a bunch of books, joined the Colorado Mycological Society, and fast forward a decade or something, I ended up in Portland, Maine. And I got a gig that that actually, I moved to Portland to work for North Spore when there were only like 12 employees and was just on the production team. And over time, my interest and knowledge grew, and it was evident that I could start leading groups and leading classes. And I started to lead our foraging and our production class, our, our cultivation classes. And after it was very clear that my body could no, no longer handle production, I moved towards fully being our events coordinator and on the customer service team and as a general spokesperson. So what did your degree from University of Denver end up being in? 
Environmental science. Environmental science. Cool. And what do you think it is about mushrooms that drew you in that like made you dive off the deep end so intensely? Well, I remember the very first reaction was sort of like, oh, wait a minute. This is like a blank spot. I know nothing about this. That's very strange. What's going on here? (laughs) And it wasn't the food aspect. Honestly, I wasn't I didn't eat mushrooms or anything. I I was never disgusted by them, but it wasn't the food that drew me in. It was just how strange they were. I had no idea that they were capable of any of it. And I just maybe had this sort of psychedelic mushroom understanding uh, of it. And I thought those were cool, but that there was so much more to it. I was just drawn right in. It's just mostly because they're weird. Yeah. And misunderstood. <laughs> Weird things are awesome. And I think that's one of the reasons that I got so interested in this conversation. And literally, this is the first time I've ever been on the podcast in this regard. And a co-host. Yeah, ever. And it is because the weird things that we don't know a lot about, they light us up, right? So like it drew you into a whole career path that honestly, it gives you the opportunity to share something that is so unique with so many people because literally most people only know the portobellos that they grab in the grocery store and that's about it. Or the magic mushrooms. Like it was interesting. I actually brought a North Spore kit to a white elephant and at the white elephant, people were making fun of me because they were like, Maria brought magic mushrooms to the white (laughs) elephant. And I'm like, no, these are gorgeous blue oyster mushrooms. Like these are expensive mushrooms. If you were to buy these in the grocery store, like you can make delicious food with these. And it is interesting how misunderstood they are and how vital they are to our environment, to our ability to like breathe. And then there's this one person in that same white elephant that was a home cook and realized just the culinary bounty that was right there and like jumped at it. And it's one of those things where it shows a real gap in knowledge. Like you talked about having that blank space in while you were studying, like if there's a blank space while you're studying and that's where you find, imagine what the casual consumer just doesn't understand. You know, a lot of times when you don't understand something, you're afraid of it. You're a little trepidatious. And and honestly, that's kind of what this whole talk is about, to be able to peel back the layers and kind of understand it at a deeper level. Yeah, I fully agree with you, man. I think it's not a exaggeration to say like full embrace of the mushroom kingdom. It's sort of like discovering gravity mm-hmm. or something <laughs> with, in, <laughs> terms awesome. of, in terms of biology yeah. for our country, for the entire world, mostly the Western world, because we've been very behind in terms of mushroom appreciation. But like, it just has is this piece of nature that I think we all need now more than ever. Yeah, it was interesting. You know, Billy and I, there's this walking trail near us and we've walked it many times. And Billy started getting interested in foraging and mushrooms specifically. And there was one particular walk. We had done the walk multiple times. There was one particular walk that Billy was like, I'm going to use this mushroom identification app and let's like go shroom hunt. We used to call it like shroom hunting. And the rule was Mm -hmm. we couldn't eat anything. We weren't allowed to eat anything. We foraged, but it was wild. We'd walk that path multiple times, never noticed the mushroom before. And then all of a sudden, once we had those glasses on looking for them, I think we saw like 16 or 17 different species of mush. Yeah. It was wild how many different mushrooms were there that have always been there in front of our eyes, but we just like didn't see them. And there was a byproduct too, where we would do this walk as a way to just get moving in the morning, right? Just as an effort to like, all right, let's stretch out. But honestly, the walk turned into, you know, three times as long as it normally is. And there was this presence that we got by paying attention and really looking to just see what we could find. And there was that every time I found something that I hadn't seen yet, there was that like Pokemon. Yeah, it was, oh, it totally it totally appealed to that third grade me with like Pokemon Blue and a brick of a Game Boy. Be like, oh my god, I found another one. And it really it's it's such a cool hobby just to find them, not even to pick them, just to like look at them, take a picture, and be like, that's really cool. Yeah. When before I can't even imagine how many I've just ran by in my lifetime. I get some of the best times of my life. You know, that some of the some of the most enjoyable days are when I can completely check out. They're more rare these days than they ever (laughs) ever were. When I can really take my time on a hike through the woods. I have a shirt. I have a shirt and it has a sloth on it and the sloth is picking mushrooms. And it says, amateur mycologist, we may never get there. (laughs) Oh Um, my God. Because it's about the journey, you know, like you got to take your time if you're looking for mushrooms. You don't cover a lot of ground. When I'm on a foraging class with a group, if we cover a, a mile loop, 
in two hours were lucky. That's awesome. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, you got to take your time and you really, you're studying the ground in front of you and it's going to be different every season and it can be different every year. I talk about it in terms of like grandma knowledge. Like it takes a lifetime mm. even just Ooh, to understand a back, like a backyard, you yeah. know, like just one chunk of wood. It'll mm. take you a long time. Okay. So let's dive in high level. What are mushrooms? Good question. So mushrooms are the fruiting body of the fungal organism. Mushrooms are just the part of the organism that you see that is producing spores. And those spores are the sexual reproductive uh, unit, sort of like a seed of the organism. But most of what the fungus is, is often underground or in wood or in some other substrate, uh, which is just the scaffolding and the food source. Most of the biomass is elsewhere, and it just produces those mushrooms when the conditions are right, when it needs to. So if what we see and what we know as a mushroom is the fruiting body, how big is a mushroom if the rest of it is underground that we can't see? Well, it's important to say that not everything produces a mushroom. And sometimes they are very, 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 very tiny. And they are still producing, you know, there is a mushroom produced but it's very, very small. And the range is nuts. You can have mushrooms the size of like head of a pin almost, like a ballpoint pen plus a little tiny stem or almost none at all, like very, very, very tiny mushrooms. Or you can have mushrooms like the Armillaria gallica specimen out in the Oregon forest, Eastern Oregon, that is like three and a half square miles. And it is a single genetic, it is a one genetic individual. And it is by biomass, the largest living thing on the planet. Holy cow. Is there a difference between fungi and mushrooms? Fungi is a much broader term. When you talk about mushrooms, you're talking about a specific organ. And you're talking about only a very distinct group of the kingdom that produces those things. So when you talk about Fungi or fungi, however you want to say it, really both are okay. It's very broad. So the kingdom fungi has, depending on who you ask, seven different phyla or phylum. And so when you talk about things about mushrooms, you're only talking about one of them. You're only talking about basidiomycota for the most part. Also ascomycota. So two of them, really. And like ascomycota are things like morels. They're cup fungi, little like sort of leathery cup fungi mm-hmm. that, you know, they, they'll they produce their spores differently. They're quite different from basidiomycota, but there's edible ones for sure. And macro fungi, right? Larger oh. fruit bodies. But basidiomycota are like the porcinis and the chanterelles mm. and the oysters. Most of what we work with are basidiomycota. That's so cool. So I knew that you were going to blow my mind multiple times on this episode, <laughs> but I just <laughs> want to reiterate We are familiar with plantae, the kingdom of plants, right? A lot of people don't understand that mushrooms aren't even in the same kingdom as plants. Mushrooms are a totally separate kingdom. Well, fungi, fungi, fungi. In Italy, we call them fungi. (laughs) And you get pizza ai fungi, (laughs) pizza with mushrooms on it. So of the fungi, we're going to call it, we're going to go Italian with it, of the fungi. No, no, I got a good one for you. I I don't want to interrupt. I'm sorry to interrupt, but. But so there is a really, really cool mycologist named Juliana Furchie. I hope to meet her one day. I'm going to drop her name until as often as possible because she's amazing. And she has done a lot through work with a foundation called the Fungi Foundation. She really, she might have been, yeah, she was a founding element of that. And she really has started to say flora, fauna, and funga. Mm. Oh, that's you know? awesome. So it really has its own, it's its own. It's its own thing. It's a three thing. Up. Completely. Yeah. (laughs) Thank you to today's episode sponsor, Espoma Organic. Plant friends, if you've been listening to the show, you know I love Espoma Organic. They've been a longtime sponsor and supporter of ours. Espoma is a 90-year-old family-owned and operated company dedicated to making safe indoor and outdoor gardening products for people, pets, and the planet. On Mushroom Day, we've got to talk about Mycotone. Espoma has enhanced several of their mixes with Mycotone, a proprietary blend of both endo and ecto mycorrhizae, something we talk about in today's episode, which have been proven to promote root growth, increase water uptake, and reduce drought stress and transplant shock. 
So they're using the mycorrhizae, the mushrooms that we talk about, and enhancing their soils. And they have potting mixes for anything that you're growing. Whether you use their general potting mix to pot up your houseplants, you pot up your succulents, your cacti, or your citrus in their cactus mix, your orchids in their orchid mix, your bonsai in their bonsai mix. If you want to get fancy and make a chunkier aeroid mix, you can take their orchid mix and mix it with their potting mix. That's what I do. And also, if you're a gardener, they have garden soil, raised bed mix. They even have compost made entirely out of mushrooms as well. To top it all off, Espoma has a huge sustainability commitment. They have 100% solar-powered plant, zero-waste manufacturing, and eco-friendly packaging. We love Espoma. Espoma loves you. To learn more about their indoor and outdoor products, visit espoma.com to see where your local Espoma dealers are, or you can click the link in the show notes to go to my Espoma Amazon storefront where I have a curated list of all of my favorite products. Plant friends, if you're interested in growing potatoes or onions this summer in your garden, you got to order them now from Territorial Seed Company. Territorial Seed Company seed potatoes are available for pre-sale, and you should order them now because they tend to sell out. So you'll order them now. They'll ship in March, but it's good to get your order in so you get exactly what you want and know that they'll be coming in the mail to you soon. Plus, Territorial Seed Company is a beloved sponsor, and they offer 10% off to people. So all you got to do is go to territorialseed.com slash growing joy, pick whatever potatoes or onions you want, and then you'll have a 10% discount automatically applied. I grew potatoes for the first time a couple summers ago with my plant friend, Melody. And I have to say, plant friend, it was wild. I eat potatoes almost every day, and I had never seen a potato plant before. And it was so fun to grow them, to see the beautiful foliage. But then also, it was like hunting for gold as you dug the potatoes potatoes up and found them, you know, sifting through the soil. Another wonderful plant Melody taught me how to grow was onions from seed. And Territorial Seed Company has an amazing variety of onion seeds for you to try sowing. They wanted me to tell you a couple of onion sowing tips. So I would recommend sowing your seeds indoors around two months before you're ready to transplant them in the garden. You sow up to 10 to 12 seeds in one four to six inch pot. If the top growth reaches over five inches before transplanting, you could cut it back to three inches. And when planting out, you can carefully separate the seedlings and place them in a shallow trench and make sure to water well so they establish. And if you don't want to start onions from seed because seed starting isn't your jam, they also just sell onion plants that are ready to go straight into your garden. You can order those now as well, and they'll ship them to you when they're ready to plant in your area. I hope you caught the recent episode that Territorial Seed Experts were featured on. We love them. They're doing amazing work. Get 10% off at territorialseed.com slash growing joy. Select your seeds and your plants that you want to grow in your garden this year, and you'll get 10% off taken off automatically at checkout when you go to territorialseed.com slash growing joy. What differentiates fungi from flora? A lot actually. They're very, very different from flora. Plants go through photosynthesis that is not involved in the fungal kingdom at all. Wow. So there's no photosynthesis, although you might have mushrooms that are in a symbiosis with organisms that do go through photosynthesis. Light can be sort of a combination of fungi and plants, and there's photosynthesis there. But a true fungi does not go through photosynthesis. It is exuding chemicals that break down its environment, enzymes. So it's a stomach externally, oh. it, whereas animals have stomachs internal. I mean, if you just think about what it would take on an evolutionary scale, go down one route and create photosynthesis and autotroph versus heterotroph. I mean, that's a real difference there. So different from an evolutionary perspective. And when you talk about external stomachs, right? So, you know, plants mm -hmm. and animals mostly consuming and creating, right? But then in the fungal kingdom, they're breaking down, you know, a lot of biomaterial that would be just pile up otherwise, right? Like how does that mm -hmm. balance exist between those three kingdoms? Great question. So when you look way back, the first fungi are thought to have inhabited land before plants. Whoa. And just the theory, I, the evidence is like kind of, well, one of the hard things about it is you don't actually have billion year old specimens. You do have like half a billion year old huh. specimens, but you, but you really don't have fossils of fungi in the same way that you have other things. It's, it's rare. And they're very hard to pinpoint, but based on the best science we have, there's estimates that there were mushrooms on land 
like a billion years ago. And this may be before plants. And some think that maybe the fungi were eating bacteria. And that's how they were able to kind of make that move before plants. Maybe it kind of happened at the same time, too. But yeah, you're totally correct that the fungus needs to break down biomass, needs to consume that and minerals, you know, and inorganic material is really important. Okay, so we know what mushrooms are now. They're different than plants. They're weird little aliens that... (laughs) don't have stomachs and digest their food on the outsides. They don't need light to survive, which is obviously why we see them in the forest floor so much. What's their purpose? Like, what do they do? So we touched on that a moment ago. They're decomposers. Okay. They are cycling. They're breaking things down, cycling nutrients, making them more available for other things, changing the form of things, chemically reacting with things. So they're really the moving around with their filaments and the filaments, the mycelium, it can be so fine. It can be inside roots. It can be outside roots. It can be inside rock. It can be inside all sorts of different uh, substances. And it's breaking and morphing those things and helping to move different ecosystems along and get the cycle going. It's obviously living for itself, but conjunct with plants and animals, it's absolutely necessary and vital for things to be the way they are in our world. Just to get really dorky for a second, it sounds like, you you know that old like high school thing where they talk about the laws of thermodynamics that matter can't be created or destroyed, but just changed. Mm -hmm. It sounds like they're a really integral part of that change cycle where they're helping bring things back. You talked about sort of transporting and changing and how they're ubiquitous and all over the place. Mm -hmm. It seems like they are that facet of that circuit that most people probably wouldn't even pay attention to because most of the time they're underfoot. Yeah, it's very hard to pay attention to. They speak such a different language. They are visually hard to pinpoint. It's just wild to think that they are able to have a deep network and transport nutrients huge distances and also communicate the need for that transport. Can you speak a little more to that? When I took a tree science class at New York Botanical Garden, I learned how the wood wide web, this underground network Mm -hmm. of mycelium that's like connecting all the plants in the forest and helping them barter. Like, can you talk a little bit about how that works? And I guess if we know the mushroom as the fruiting body, like how many different parts of a mushroom are there that work in tandem together? Or a fungi. Yeah. It's hard to like speak about a fungal organism without using the word mushroom. Yeah. Sure. Like hard sometimes, like what is the single word there? It's sort of it fine to say mushroom. <laughs> it's just like there's really nothing better, I guess. What you're really talking about is mycorrhizal organisms. Mycorrhizal yeah. and mycelium, they're two M words. Oopsies. Yeah, it's totally okay. So you have some mushrooms that we can farm, right? We're able to farm saprobes or saprophytes, and these saprobes eat dead stuff, and that's it. So they can be farmed because we can just take a bunch of wood, put them on that wood, and they will grow, and they will eat that, and they will fruit, and we can farm them. But there's a lot out there that We wish we could farm, but we can't because it requires relationships to trees. There is a communication. There's a transfer of nutrients that we just cannot stimulate. Maybe someday we're humans if we put our minds to it. But chanterelle, various bolis like porcini that I mentioned, many, many, many others that are ectomycorrhizal, which means that their mycelium is coating the outside of roots. And there's an exchange of nutrients. They're providing different minerals and water, and the tree is providing carbon. And so they absolutely need that relationship. And they can't just eat dead. They're not saprobes in that way. And then you have certain things that are endomycorrhizal, which just live within the roots of plants and are vital as well, but don't have a fruiting body whatsoever. Is their purpose communication primarily between, are they breaking down material if they live inside of a root or do they have another primary purpose? They can still be breaking down material. I mean, they're still interacting with the surface of the root and there is still mycelial interaction there, but it is also communication related with kind of partner organisms, partner species that can also be fungal. Very complex 
to different trees, different plants, neighboring plants, often offspring. I'm reminded of like, uh, I think you, when you were taking your class at the Botanic Garden, you probably talked about Suzanne Simard. Yeah. The overstory is 75% amazing. <laughs> I don't want to crap on it, but the last like 75 pages or, or 50 pages, I didn't understand why the book was still going. Yeah. I thought it was great brilliant book but i didn't understand why it hadn't ended yeah it you takes a saying? turn it, it takes a turn at the end yeah. for sure listen for this sure. is coming yeah. from a music major i don't there's plenty of operas that i don't know why they didn't end <laughs> in this in the first act yeah. i get that sometimes you, you nail it in the beginning but you know it's so funny you mentioned that because when you're talking about the communication right and how the trees will use the mycorrhizal networks in order to communicate and support each other it seems like there's a symbiotic relationship there as well as, you know, after, after any plant material might die, it breaks it down. But then when I walk into the woods, I see uh, traditional cap mushrooms. I see shelf fungus. I see like these little puff balls, which are my favorite things in the world to step on. But I am always curious, what determines the structural makeup of the fruiting body of the fungus, the, the mushroom itself? Because you'll see yeah, these- they look so different. They're all so different. Yeah. Like you'll see the chanterelle, like you mentioned earlier, that that like trumpet structure. Or and, turkey tail. Yeah, the turkey, yeah, turkey tail. That'll be, there'll just be hundreds of them. Is there any predetermined nature as to why they're the shape that they are as a fruiting body? Well, it's a complicated question. There's a lot that you could say about the evolutionary history of the different structures and when they appear. For example, something like destroying angel mushroom, which is a very poisonous, very complex organism with gills, right? Mushrooms like that came on the scene later than sort of your crusty shelf mushroom or even your puffballs, mm -hmm. or certainly more than your or later on the scene than your smuts and your rusts and things like that. So there was an evolution in complexity, certain. That explains it partially, but also a lot of what happens with evolution is there's a niche that needs to be filled. And as generations go by over the course of hundreds of millions of years, the end of mutation take hold and they find that, that those things just work. But the other thing is, what food sources are available and how does that dictate the change in their structure, in their morphology, in their uh, physiology? You have white rot fungus and brown rot fungus, right? Mm -hmm. So you have mushrooms that are white rot are more complex and came later and they are capable of digesting lignin and cellulose, whereas brown rot can just digest cellulose and not lignin. I think I have that right. I think I have oh, that right. Oh, so, okay. So if it, plants got yeah. more complex, there was an evolutionary need to have a fungus that could break down the more complex biomass as time went on. Yeah, and they would change as, as time went on. So they're growing right along with us. That's so cool. I never thought about it that way. It sometimes boggles the mind to remember that things are speciating right now. That is happening right now. And <laughs> like with something like a, like a mushroom, it's happening pretty fast. Some fungal organisms are going through many generations much faster. And there's just like crazy genetic combination happening. I had some friends who worked in a fruit fly lab in college and they were putting all these crazy genetic changes into the fruit flies because they were going through so many generations so fast that they could do that. Whoa. Wow. Of course, you have fruit fly friends. <laughs> like it's like fry. My, my fruit fly. Yeah. Say that three times fast. Yeah, I can't no say that. That's interesting. I just did this interview about plant intelligence, and I was talking to this professor about like how plants, who evolves with who? Like, do the plants evolve because humans and society is evolving, or are humans evolving alongside the plants? It's interesting to then add fungi into this as well. Boggling the mind. It is like. A, I'm jealous in a way because the group of people that you're connected with, your network of people that are paying attention to things like fungi and fruit flies, and these things are evolving quickly, right? There's so much excitement in that. And meanwhile, so many of us really don't ever plug into that. So to think about being surrounded by so much dynamic nature is it, it kind of makes you just want to run out into the woods and look around. You know what I mean? And frolic in the mushrooms. Yeah, like it the really is do. so awesome. There's an organization called 
fund and like F F U N D I S, I think. And I forgot what the acronym is for exactly, but basically they are doing really important work with cataloging different fungal species and understanding fungal diversity and changes in that diversity. And what is the distribution of these species that we really, we really have a very, very minimal understanding of, of that right now. And so with genetic, with advances in genetics, we're understanding what's there now. We didn't even, we haven't even really understood what's, what's in our own backyard. We're talking about an estimated 6 million species. Uh, 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 so guys. crazy. Yeah. Wow. yeah, I know. And think about like how many do we eat? A hundred? Like how many do <laughs> we so, know? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. That we like cultivate. So before we get into, Billy has so many great questions about nutritional value. You know, this mini series goes way beyond our houseplants, but I do for our houseplant listeners have to ask you a couple of houseplant specific questions. Number one, we talked about the mycorrhizal network. There are so many like potting mixes and composts that say that they actually have mycorrhizae in them because it's said that they help our houseplants or plants like uptake water, uptake nutrients faster. So is that because the mycorrhizae gets like activated and bonds with the roots and aids in that? Like, how does that work? Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, given that the species that they put in there is actually like viable and actually bonds with the plant species that you've mm -hmm. put it in, it truly is a breakthrough for farming and for indoor cultivation and indoor cultivation, especially because you can't sort of foster that sort of environment where it, it generates on itself. Mm -hmm. You kind of have to put it there in a indoor environment in a lot of cases. And it is breaking down minerals and facilitating water transfer. And it's just the fact that there is so much surface area when you have these tiny little filaments that they can transfer to plants. And it is absolutely critical. There are plants that like they will not survive, especially in their younger stages when they first germinate and they really don't have much of a root system. They are absolutely dependent. I even read that it can be thought of as almost a um, parasitic relationship right. where like the plant is parasitizing right. the fungi. It oh, can, yeah, wow. crazy. Yeah. That's wild. And the question I had to ask you is, what are the mushrooms that pop up in my houseplant soil? <laughs> I get these messages mm -hmm. from listeners all the time with photos of these cute little mushrooms. And it's like, what are they? Do I have to remove them? Are they toxic? Are they helping? What's going on there? Are they little yellow mushrooms? Yeah, they're little yellow yeah. mushroom babies. Yeah. Maybe it's Leucocoprinus americana. I am 100% sure it's Leucocoprinus. And there's numerous Leucocoprinus species. And they're copernellus and copernopsis. Uh, copernoids are like broadly kind of thought of as inky cap. But for whatever reason, that is just a really prime habitat for that. And it loves potting soil and it loves being overwatered. So it really is a symptom of overwatering. In my experience, that in itself doesn't really kill your plants. The overwatering can mm -hmm. definitely yeah, for sure, for sure. Uh, so it's like right, a but they are a signal that you're overwatering your plant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. They're not edible. They're not going to hurt you. They're just cute little mushroom, little yellow mushrooms. But at that point, you know, you may want to, um, if you're really going to get rid of them, you may want to transfer to some pressed soil and kind of give your roots a wash. Yeah, they're very common. Those little yellow mushrooms. Yes. The, the common name is flower pot dapperling. No that's, way. The, okay. that's the best name ever. <laughs> I love that. But they're obviously so common. So I want to ask you a little bit about how to grow mushrooms, but we're, we are dedicating separate episodes to that. But before that, I know Billy wants to nerd out with you on a different kind of side of of shroomies. So Billy, why don't why don't you hit him with some of your questions? Sure. Yeah. So I guess a little bit of background as to why I'm asking these questions first. So like a lot of other people, we're getting marketed all sorts of products with, they call them all sorts of, you know, uh, helpful mushrooms, adaptogenic mushrooms, Adaptogens, uh, yeah. all sorts of things. And I think that there, in fact, I know that there's a lot of misconceptions around A, what these terms mean, because they seemingly have just appeared overnight. You know, B, what the viability of these mushrooms actually is. And there's just, and C, you know, kind of this general feeling of confusion. So what I want wanted to do is break it down and say, you know, we hear a lot about how mushrooms can have health benefits in terms, but these terms are all interchangeable or they're thrown around interchangeably rather adaptogens, anti-inflammatory, functional mushrooms, nootropic mushrooms. 
starting off with the big one, can you define what adaptogenic mushrooms are to a human? Yeah, sort of. They are really fluffy terms that got thrown around a lot without strict definition. And I don't like it. Uh, a lot of times I just try and bring people back down to earth and say, it's nutrition, folks. Uh, it, is, okay. it is nutrition. Yeah, It's not anything like crazy up here. There are very novel things, but like this is food, most of it. And like, let's not forget that it's food for the most part. But uh, adaptogenic refers to the fact that targeting base immune function and help the body do whatever it is that it needs to do. Oh, so okay. it will uh, soften your immune system, lower your immune reactions, it, and it can help with, for example, autoimmune diseases that are often a, a result of an overactive immune system, or it can help raise your immune system and help prevent infection and help your body fight back. Huh. So it's coming at it from both sides, right? I think the term nutrition is really important because that's something that people feel a little bit more connected to as, okay, I want to make nutritional choices. You know, specifically one of the things that's thrown around is the anti-inflammatory effects of mushrooms. The one that I'm thinking of was chaga. Chaga and reshi, I believe, are at least marketed to have anti-inflammatory properties. Is it a similar mechanism like taking a vitamin have on your body, how are these actually helping in inflammatory responses? There are a lot of complicated things going on, and there are plenty of vitamins and minerals in the mushroom, just like a, a vitamin that you might take. I mean, they are full of nutrition, which even just saying that, maybe it sounds obvious to you, but like, in our society, that was not a given that mushrooms were healthy. It was just sort of like they were just there. Like, no, they are full of protein and they have a full spectrum of amino acids and they've got tons of fiber. Now, this is really important beyond the minerals, which they have a lot of too. And vitamin B and vitamin D got a lot of fiber. And some of that fiber is chitin and some of that fiber is beta glucan. And there's different beta glucans. And beta glucans is something you, that may ring a bell. You may yeah. have heard of that. There, it's a it's a polysaccharide uh, can basically pass through uh, large intestine and go into the small intestine. Or wait, do I have that backwards? Either way, it passes deep into the digestive tract and really feeds your gut biome oh. and really affects your immune system through the gut. Is really really a powerful, well studied component of these mushrooms and is, is really one of the pathways that they, they see these these particles of beta glucan latching on to tumor cells and things like that and really kind of spreading throughout the body and having all sorts of interesting effects. It really sounds too good to be true when you say something like reishi is good for sleep and good for mood and good for allergies and good for this and good for that. It's like, what are you talking about? You know, water. Yeah. The only other thing that does that is water mm. and yeah. air. <laughs> but uh, really, I mean, it, it just shows how like foundational to our health. It just uh, like it, it's its own food group, right? Yeah. Mushrooms are their own food group. You don't leave out veggies. You don't leave out fruit. You don't leave out mushrooms. Wait, okay, hold on. I have to repeat that back because that's something I've never thought of. I've never once considered, we've never seen a food pyramid that has mushrooms, mushrooms somewhere it, yeah. on there. But I mean, from what you're saying, it really should be considered that integral to our overall health, just in terms of like, obviously, the, neither of us are doctors and, and we all want to make sure that we're doing the right thing. But at the same time, I think that that it's something that I know that I've never considered as a consumer who picks food specifically for their for its health benefits, right? Like, we all know to grab an orange for vitamin C. We all know to grab leafy greens for vitamin K, right? So you said that mushrooms have high in protein content. Did I hear that right? Very high protein content by dry weight, very high. And it's a full protein too. So fully bioavailable. Well, fully bioavailable is not necessarily unless they're cooked, okay. right? Mushrooms need to be cooked. So that's an, an important aspect. Then it becomes very bioavailable, but a full spectrum of amino acids. You know, it's like why you eat rice and beans together. Yeah. Because with <laughs> rice and beans together, you get the full spectrum of amino yeah. acids. But with, with mushrooms, like if you eat, well, like, properly cooked shiitake mushrooms, yeah. you are getting a full spectrum protein. What about powdered versus whole? Like lion's mane is, mu is a mushroom that has so many amazing benefits. 
you don't see lions made in the grocery store. We can grow them with your grow kits, but you don't see lions made in the grocery store as much, but you see lions made powder. Am I getting mm-hmm. the same benefits? Is it better to eat the actual mushroom? Well, you've touched on a very interesting topic and it can be somewhat controversial. There was sort of a war going on between people in the mushroom world. Some people were saying that the mycelium was better. Some people saying the fruiting body is better. Some people really concerned that when you take an extract of the mycelium, you may be getting an extract of all the grain mm. and whatever else oh. it's growing on. I am biased in that North Four only works with fruiting bodies and the purity aspect of that. But there is evidence that there are compounds in higher, much higher concentrations in the mycelium and specifically lion's mane. Um, has some really interesting research to back that up. There is something called arinosine, group of compounds called arinosine, and they are some of the most exciting uh, components that are helpful for uh, nerve function, for cognitive function, and those are found in higher concentrations in the mycelium. But then there's something called arisinone, and that is in the fruiting body more. So you want both. Because you hear Billy and I are obsessed with the movie Fantastic Fungi. We've watched it probably four times now. And there's that great scene at the end of it where Paul Stamets is talking about how he helped, like, cure his mother's cancer by feeding her. Was it lion's mane or was it? No, it was turkey tail in conjunction with chemotherapy that that, that allowed the medicine to become more effective. Yeah. So that was that was what he was talking about, Mm -hmm. I think. If you were going to pick one or two mushrooms, really? as like a supplement for your life, turkey tail would be right up there with one that you might choose, reishi, the one we already mentioned, but also lion's mane. I mean, these are these are all like well studied and understood to have a myriad, you know, like a, a huge variety of benefits and they share a lot of the same benefits. And with the turkey tail, is that the powder or is that growing the mushroom? Can I grow turkey tail with Norspore? I don't think so. We don't currently. We do sell cultures of it. Okay. We have it in capsule form, the powder. So the, you could have the, the mushroom and you could powder the mushroom. But what you're getting at is extract, right? And the extract powder. And the extract powder, if it's very well made, it is essentially just a concentrated form of all of the components of the full mushroom and you need less. It really depends on a lot of things. I am of the opinion that probably the absolute best way to consume your mushrooms, and there isn't a better way, is to just eat them and cook them and eat them, right? Yeah. So you're never going to hear me say, like, the extract is the best, but as a medicine, right, when it becomes a medicine, when a doctor uh, says to you, which in in Japan especially, they've been using turkey tail uh, in China to really supplement, like, chemotherapy, they might want you to take like 500 milligrams right and so of of extract right and that's just what we suggest to take for a day but there are herbalists and practitioners out there who will say take three grams in a day Mm. and so one thing that that demonstrates is everybody's different everybody's an individual and these things are very safe overall one other thing to consider is that it's hard to know if you want taking something for a really long time years is going to reduce its efficacy for you. And if you need to sort of cycle sure. with them, or if you need to switch from one to the other, these things are like pretty cutting edge. There's a, not enough research still on a lot of this. Well, you know, I think you brought up something that is really important when you're talking about safety and efficacy. I think that safety is also as far as you can trust where you're getting these mushrooms from. And what I've seen at North Spore is the care that's put into every aspect of the cultivation of these mushrooms. And like, you know, I've gone out into the woods before and yeah, I've seen turkey tail, but I've also seen mushrooms that look very similar to turkey tail and might be a little different. Never. Um, I and- would never allow it. <laughs> my gosh, I'm so excited to tell you about the sheets in my bed. Is that so weird? I am obsessed 
with my Cozy Earth sheets. Plant friends, when you think about it, we take so much time thinking about the quality of soil we put our plants in, if it's organic, if our plants are doing well, if they're happy. But what about our figurative soil? You know, we spend so much time in bed when you think about how how much we sleep. Sleep is the foundation for optimum health. So doesn't it make sense to set ourselves up for success with sleep, with bedding that reflects that? Well, Cozy Earth sheets were named one of Oprah's favorite things in 2018, and I totally get why. Cozy Earth's best-selling bamboo sheet set is temperature-regulating and incredibly soft. Plant friends, Billy and I have been sleeping in these sheets for the last like two or three months, and we will never go back. They are so silky soft. They get softer every time you wash them. They're incredible. And I know that it says that they're temperature regulating, but I have to say I'm a sweaty sleeper. I run really hot and these sheets feel cool to touch. It's like hard to explain. You, you'll understand when you feel them, but I couldn't believe when I took them out of the packaging, like how soft and silky they were, but they're made from bamboo. So they're made from 100% premium viscose bamboo. And they're the softest sheets ever, way softer than any hotel bed we've ever slept in, which is also an insane thing for me to say, but it's true. They gifted me my first pair of sheets, but I liked them so much that I actually went out and bought a second set of the Cozy Earth sheets because I don't ever want to sleep in anything else. (laughs) It sounds dramatic, but it's true, plant friends. Billy and I are changed humans. Plus, I like that Cozy Earth has a lengthy warranty and everything you need for bedding with a variety of pillows, sheets, blankets, and even cozy pajamas. Plus, this is incredible. They're offering you 35% off, 35% off these premium luxury bamboo sheets and everything on their website. All you got to do is use the code GROWINGJOY at checkout. So you can go to CozyEarth.com, use code GROWINGJOY at checkout for 35% off. This is not a drill. Okay, so I am always on the hunt for new podcasts to listen to, and I figured if you're listening to this podcast, you might be too. So if you're looking for another show that nourishes your soul, then you have to check out No Small Endeavor, produced by my friends at Great Feeling Studios and PRX. No Small Endeavor explores what it means to live meaningfully just like this show. In each episode, award-winning professor and host Lee C. Camp brings you thoughtful conversations with artists, philosophers, and theologians like The Office actor Rain Wilson and West Wing's Michael Sheen about what it means to truly flourish. If you need a place to start, I highly recommend their recent episode with New York Times bestselling author Gretchen Rubin. The conversation is all about what it takes to be happy day by day. So go ahead, plant friend. Go follow No Small Endeavor on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts and tell them I sent you. That's no small endeavor. We're at the beginning of our mycological love and journey, right? There's this desire to have a group of experts that steep themselves in this knowledge all the time to be able to educate us as people who are excited about this and to also dissuade some of the term mycophobia that's pretty prevalent and is becoming, it's kind of been buffeted recently with pretty popular show. The one I'm talking about, have you seen this show? What is it? The Last of Us? It's on HBO? Yeah. Absolutely. There was another one is how to change your mind. I was thinking about yeah. that. Right. But uh, the, the last of us. Yeah. My brother played the video game and said it was like the best thing ever. I didn't actually play the game, but I am watching the show and have been very impressed so far. That third episode, heartbreaking the whole way, but very straight, very far. It didn't have a lot to do with mushroom zombies, but uh, the mushroom involved in the show, right? Cordyceps. I take cordyceps. I took cordyceps this morning. Yeah, um, so did I. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I'm not a zombie. So, okay. you know, yeah. I, I just kind of think that I, the reason I want to bring it up is because I have found there's been like memes circulating all over Instagram, you know, about this like budding fear of specifically cordyceps mushrooms that it's not grounded in any reality. We know that this isn't real, but it does belie the desire for, you know, this is why this is one of many future conversations, because I want to get deeper into understanding how to best prepare mushrooms, how to best preserve mushrooms, how to best, how to identify what's a good mushroom versus a bad mushroom on the grocery shelf, you know, and then 
when we're working with, with kits like you guys have, you know, when, when's the best time to harvest? So I, there's so many questions and it could go on absolutely forever. I'm going to slow myself down because I think that you've hit on so many important aspects of understanding that these mushrooms are integral to sort of building blocks of general nutrition, kind of helping, you know, dissuade away all of the confusion with adaptogens and anti-inflammatories and stuff. And we can go mushroom by mushroom at some point, but the general knowledge of if somebody wants to educate themselves more, do you have like a, a couple of books or, you know, resources that you think are really good for a complete one-on-one beginner to start at? Yeah. I mean, I've got a few, I've got a a lot of books, but it really depends on what area you're getting, you're, you're talking about, right? So if you're talking about medicinal, like using the functional mushrooms, medicinal mushrooms, whatever, you're sort of looking to incorporate them as a supplement. This book is great. Healing Mushrooms by Tiro Isocapilla. He is a Finnish dude who started a really, really successful now company called Four Sigmatic. Oh, yeah. And he oh, has a. We love yeah. Four Sigmatic. Shout out. Yeah. We've yeah. been drinking their uh, coffee for years. Years. Yeah. So there you go. I mean, they've really, really become a major, major player and are doing a lot of cool work. And he is the real deal. He, he has an updated book called Healing Adaptogens that's a little broader, some updated information. But. When this book came out in like 2017, that wasn't even that long ago, there wasn't anything out there that was like clear and concise with some recipes. It was just great. If you really want to just like check and see what Chaga is about, check and see what Cordyceps about, is it have a, a fairly updated reference through this book. If you're foraging and that's what you're talking about, that's a whole different ball game. And you might want to look at regional guides. Okay. It's really going to be pretty specific to where you live. This book is the best book for beginners in New England. It's Edible and Medicinal Mushrooms of New England and Eastern Canada by <laughs> David Sparr. David. Very specific. David Sparr is a good friend of mine. At this, I've hung out with, with David a bunch of times, and he really is like a, a treasure, sort of like a curmudgeonly naturalist. You know, he gardens. He knows all the plants. He's just like an overall naturalist and really oh. has a lot of impressive knowledge. He's a fun guy to talk to. You knew it was going to happen yeah. at some point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Happened totally on accident. But uh, yeah, this book is great because it clearly highlights some of the most desirable species. Color photos, that kind of thing. Oh, wait, then... I just got it. A fun guy. <laughs> fun guy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, Maria. Okay, keep yeah, going. The, the, the dad jokes are See, real. I didn't take my cordyceps this morning. <laughs> I didn't take it. That's why yeah. I didn't get the joke. I used to work at the farmer's market for North for a, a few years. And, oh, boy, it was almost every weekend someone would lay that on me. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's yeah. like when somebody's at a restaurant and they're have a and they they're part of the clean plate club and they're like, oh, did you enjoy it? No, I hated it. Like that joke. Yeah. Every that server's joke. heard that joke. <laughs> exactly. Exactly like that. It's, there's a lot of things you hear. We used to sort of joke about compiling all the mushroom jokes. Yeah. Some of them kind of just dad joke, harmless, and other ones are a little brutal. There's some great ones, mushroom joke. That's so funny. Yeah. We used to play uh, this thing uh, called Beer Fest Bingo, where when people would come up and ask the same questions every single time, we would all have different bingo boards. And every time somebody heard one of the old things, we would cross it off. And you would literally hear somebody yell out, bingo, like when they got bingo on the board. <laughs> We should have done that at the market and given people prizes if they if they got bingo. Oh, they yeah, they get so. they get some turkey tail yeah. capsules if, if they win. Yeah, yeah. One other book I wanted to mention though, which is sort of just like the overall, like full of different types of knowledge. But if you really want to get hyped, my great aunt read this book and just like the look in her eyes, she was just like, "Lou, I had no idea." Is this one Entangled Life by Merlin Sheldrake? That is his real name. Merlin Sheldrake. <laughs> I, I was sure that it was a pseudonym, right? Yeah. Like that right. it was just like a no. His name is Merlin Sheldrake. Oh, what a And he's man. brilliant. And this is a beautiful book and should be read by all. And, and and if this doesn't inspire you to take further steps, nothing will. We have a 14 hour drive. Maybe we'll download an audiobook and listen to it. Thousand percent. Okay. Billy might be done with his questions. I just have a couple quickies that I want to ask you. You mentioned that you take cordyceps in the morning. I'm curious, as a mushroom expert, like what are the mushrooms that you are routinely eating for their benefits? 
Well, I use what's available to me and I'm very, very lucky that a lot is available to me. I have eaten my weight in blue oyster mushrooms 500 times over. (laughs) Whether it's blue oyster, golden oyster, lion's mane, I had been always eating those things. Currently, unfortunately, North Shore, we don't do those farmer's markets anymore. We're not as focused on our fresh mushroom production. So I haven't been bringing home as many of those, but I always have dried mushrooms. You mm-hmm. better believe stuff that either I grew or foraged. And so I'll sprinkle black trumpets onto, uh, into pasta or on pizza Ooh. and take some maitake out and rehydrate that and throw it in off whatever. So I'm, I'm consistently eating it and I have access to the capsules and the tinctures. I don't take everything all at once. I've been sort of letting it kind of happen, usually like one at a time. So I had a reishi open and I was taking that very regularly. I finished that and I opened up a cordyceps. And then I also opened up a immunity blend. The immunity blend has chaga, rishi, sitaki, and maitake. Mm -hmm. And then I'm also taking, and so it has those four, and I'm also taking cordyceps. So that's what I'm taking right now. But it kind of varies. Yeah, it definitely, it definitely varies for me. And I will take it every day. I'm very regular with it, but it sort of cycles through whatever tincture I kind of grab. Seasons to it. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. I want to tease, you know, this is going to be a four-part series. <laughs> what are the different ways? I mean, I, I wish we had another hour to talk right now. We're going to break down in these upcoming episodes how to grow mushrooms outside, how to grow mushrooms inside. What are the different ways that you can grow mushrooms affordably in your home that we are going to unpack and learn about over the course of our little shroomy series? There's some great ways. One of the easiest ways, and if you really are not acquainted with these organisms, you should start with, is the spray and grow kit. The basic tabletop kit allows you to just cut it open. There's a little sprayer in the top, and you can grow four species, lion's mane, pink oyster, golden oyster, blue oyster, and these are aggressive, fast-growing. They can handle different environments. They do need that humidity, though. So you spray them regularly, but they're very adaptable, and that's really the place to start. And you can learn about, like, how, what does it look like when it's ready to harvest? Just like you said, what is it? Is it still good if it's a pile of slime? Like, is that, <laughs> is that still good? People don't know. They really don't know. You don't know, know what, what you don't know. Is, yeah. Right. Is this mold? Is this thing moldy? Is this... So you really can get basic foundational understanding from there. Another method that we'll talk about is the monotub, which is a cool method for growing various species and requires a a bit more technique, has a bit more risk, but it can have a lot of reward. And it's sort of like creating a a mini greenhouse, so to speak, a grow chamber for species that like to grow on a flat surface. Like it's not a great way to grow lion's mane, but it could be really good for something like piapino. We'll also talk about using a boom room or a Martha tent. We'll talk about log cultivation. Oh, I'm so excited about about the logs. Yeah. Logs are ancient, right? Log cultivation has been going around, been used and has been adapted for thousands of years now. And so that may be like the coolest. Honestly, if I had to pick one thing that I think is like the coolest way to grow mushrooms, without a doubt, like shiitake logs. Yeah. Like they're the coolest thing. And then from there, there's also beds. And you can grow these mushrooms in bed with your plant and do all sorts of different fun experiments. And I don't think a lot of people understand that because our community is all gardeners. And the fact that you can grow mushrooms in your garden bed alongside your plants, I didn't know that. Like you can intentionally Mm. do that. Obviously, you're going to have mushrooms pop up that you don't know in your garden. But I just think that's so cool. I mean, they look cool. They're edible. They help break things down. So they're going to help enrich soil. Yeah. It's a good thing all around. It is something that I used to talk to master gardeners and they had no idea about this Yeah, because (laughs) it's a cool way to think about the whole ecosystem. If you're going to simulate the world around you, which is kind of what a garden is, right? You're trying to be as like true to nature. You're trying, you're trying to make things healthy. You're trying to, yes, you're controlling it, but you need to incorporate kind of everything that's in everything that's out there to kind of make it all work. Yeah. Work for you and not against you. Flora, fauna, and fungi. 
flora, fauna, funga. Yeah, that's how they help you. That's how you get it to work well. I love that. Well, Billy and I, between this interview and the next interview, are going to break out some of your kits and grow them. We've grown kits before of other companies. And I have to say, the reason why I approached you guys, that's a sexy grow kit. Your oh, branding awesome. is on point. I remember I saw Norse Born, I saw one of your grow kits in a store and I looked at Billy being like, what is that blue oyster mushroom in this black box? Like, this is so giftable. And I actually stole the kit back. I brought it to the white elephant and I stole it back. She literally so- <laughs> traded back for it. It was awesome. Because I was like, so- still get it. One of the things that's been really, really powerful for us is Matt McInnes, one of the owners. Matt, Eli, and John own the company and started it. Uh, they met at College of the Atlantic in Maine. And Matt had a lot of experience working in fine food and as a photographer mm. and has just this incredible aesthetic. Thing. Yeah, the aesthetic um, is and on really, point. And really created that for North Spore. But John has the, the master's degree in mycology and added that. And Aliyah has a lot of business acumen, is really uh, worked in greenhouses. And uh, so together, like when I met them, I said, if anybody's going to be able to do this and put this together in a way that's attractive and effective, it's going to be them. I love it. I love it. So cool. Well, we're going to grow your kits. I'm really excited. We'll report back for our next episode. And the next episode is going to be how to grow logs right in time for springtime in case people want to be growing outdoors in time for spring. So make sure you're subscribed, plant friends, because we're bringing some fire content, (laughs) shroomy content. Where can people find you and North Spore if they're interested in checking out everything you guys have to offer? We are on TikTok and YouTube and Instagram, Facebook, all the things, North Spore and NorthSpore.com. You can send us an email to info at NorthSpore.com as well. And North Spore is going to offer our listeners an amazing discount. The coupon code is in the show notes and you can visit it on my website. Thank you so much, Louie. We are so excited. This, this was, was so fun. I learned so much. I honestly got to feel like I've been shot out of a cannon. It's so cool to get to talk about this. And, and thank you for all the knowledge and, and for bearing with me in my utter geekiness. It only gets deeper from here. <laughs> Maria, Billy, thank you. A crazy time ahead. I'm headed next week on Monday to Vegas for an expo thing. And it's like, it's called the Champ Expo. And it's basically going to be alternative products like everything you might find at a head shop it's going to be a funky place so, take pictures I mean, send them to us <laughs> busy week. yeah yeah i will definitely uh, be recording what's going on to the extent i'm allowed <laughs> thanks for having me i really did enjoy this so that was louie plant friends this was only episode one yeah Episode two, we're actually doing episode two's interview tomorrow. And when we get back, we're in Florida right now as we record this. But when we get back, we're going to be growing the indoor. We have the blue oyster mushroom kit, the pink oyster mushroom kit. Uh, We're going to take, I believe, some of the supplements, some of the mushrooms. Yeah, we're going to experiment. We're going to like use ourselves as little dummies to um, experiment with some of the stuff that they have. We're going to test drive some of these North Spore products and share with you our experience with them, how we feel, some of the things that we learn along the way, as well as, uh, you know, the process of learning how to grow mushrooms. We're going to kind of come at it from genesis all the way to consumption and talk about how we can learn a little bit more about uh, each step as we go. It's going to be really, really cool. I'm really excited. Yeah, we're in Florida right now as we record this, but we when we get back, we have multiple of their mushroom indoor grow kits, mm-hmm. the simplest way that you can do it. Um, we're going to start and we will keep you guys posted on social media with how that goes. We're also going to, like Billy said, try taking some of the supplements. If you want to grow alongside us, if you're curious, you can go to nordspore.com and use code GROWINGJOY at checkout to get 10% off. There will be a mushroom pasta happening at some point as well along the way. That's going to happen. Oh, yeah. We were at dinner with Mama Fiala the other day, and she said we already have the four episodes, but she said she'll come on for a fifth episode to give us all of her mushroom food recipes. But yeah, so if you're interested, go to nosepore.com. You can use code GROWINGJOY. It's our affiliate link. So if you do purchase anything, just so you know, Growing Joy actually gets a percentage of the sale at no cost to you. So thank you so much for your support. I'm also really excited about the next episode. We're doing the interview tomorrow. It's going to be about how to grow mushrooms outdoors. I had no idea you can literally like inoculate your gardens to grow mushrooms next to your tomatoes. I can't wait to interview him about that. But um, plant friends, 
I personally am proud of this mini series and honored to have Billy join us and honored to be working with Norse on it. This is so fun. I feel like a kid again. I feel like I feel like episode one of Bloom and Grow Radio. It's so fun. It's like it's a fun, invigorating place to be. I never ever thought that I would do anything like this, and it's just uh, it's really humbling and really really cool. And honestly, it's it's amazing that we get to talk to people like Louis who share a passion and are already way further down the line of knowledge. So they get to kind of share with those of us who are newbies. Yeah. yeah. So you guys can go check out Louis and North Spore at Northspore.com. Check me out at Growing Joy with Maria check across socials. Billy will also be on my account. That's where we'll be tracking our, our mushroom endeavors. And make sure that you're subscribed to this podcast so you don't miss the rest of the mushroom mini series, which will be trickling out over the next next couple of months and also all of the other amazing content that we have for you to help you keep blooming and keep growing joy. Woohoo! Plant friend, thank you so much for tuning in today. If you like what you heard, make sure that you're subscribed to the show so you don't miss an episode. We have incredible episodes lined up in 2023 and I don't want you to miss one topic. And while you're subscribing, would you mind clicking over to the review section and leaving us a review? Reviews are tremendously helpful for the growth of the podcast, so I thank you in advance for helping this podcast reach as many planty earbuds as possible across the globe. If you're looking for more opportunities to grow as a plant parent with Growing Joy content, we've got a ton of free options for you. First, there's the Plant Parent Personality Test. It's so fun. It takes literally three minutes to complete. You take the test, you get your Plant Parent Personality Profile and a curated list of plants, projects, and podcast episodes that are right up your alley, tailored just for you, inspired by your results. The link is in the show notes. Make sure to let me know what your personality is after you take the test. If you're looking to uplevel your plant parent game, check out my website. We've got a bunch of free guides that you can download on topics like understanding natural light, which is actually a three-day worksheet, and nine ways to green up your office if you need to bring a little bit of planty joy into your work life. And finally, I want to invite you to join the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet, my online garden society. It's both a web platform and an iOS and Android app. It allows our listeners to get together in an algorithm and troll-free online space to swap plant care tips, humble brag about plant wins, and get support when you have plant fails. We have monthly live planty show and tells on Zoom, which are so fun, and even have a living library of planty book recommendations sourced from our community. You can go to jointhegardensociety.com to grab your membership. And for anything else, plant friend, I am here for you. Feel free to drop me a line, whether you have an idea for an episode, an event, or maybe you're even a planty business interested in sponsoring the show. And of course, following me on Instagram and TikTok for daily planty silliness, musings, and tips is always recommended. You can find me across socials at Growing Joy with Maria. Thank you again so much for listening. It is truly my honor and life's delight to help you keep blooming and keep growing joy. Plant care is self-care on Growing Joy, the podcast. Make new plant friends, propagate knowledge, and grow some freaking joy. That's the motto of the Growing Joy Garden Society app and platform, otherwise known as the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet. If you've been an OG listener or a longtime listener, you might also know this app and platform as the Bloom and Grow Garden Party, but with the rebrand, we've rebranded it to the Growing Joy Garden Society. No trolls allowed, kind plant friends only. And if you haven't heard about the society yet, Plant Friend, you got to join. It's my online community that you can access via iOS or Android app or on your computer that I built to connect our international community of plant friends so we can all nerd out together about plants and celebrate our passion for our beloved plant babies. We have members literally all over the world. I'm so in love with this community of sweet plant friends. I can't say enough amazing things about them. But also there's a lot of really cool features about the app you might be interested in. There's dedicated hashtags to all sorts of different subsects of planty passions like houseplants, gardening, plant-inspired DIY projects, growing joy, plants and pets, and so many more. There's a plantrepreneur group. So if you're a planty entrepreneur and you want to connect with other planty entrepreneurs, you can join that group to connect and network. There's a plant swap section. Plus, the entire app, and this is my favorite part, is entirely searchable. So say you want to learn more about Hoya, you type the word Hoya into the search bar, and literally every post ever created about Hoya will 
will pop up. So you can click in, see what other people have been posting about Hoya and learn on your own and crowdsource hair information. It's so cool. But last but not least, it's an amazing way to support the show. Your monthly membership not only goes to sustaining the platform, but it also supports my team of editors, writers, and a community manager that help the world of Bloom and Grow keep growing. So come join us. All you got to do is go to jointhegardensociety.com and sign up for the community plan. Once again, you go to jointhegardensociety.com and click the community plan. Hot take plant friends, there is no one right starter plant. There, I said it. And you know what? While I'm at it, there are also no real plant killers in the world. There are just people who have not figured out their right plants for their lifestyle. This is why I created the free Plant Parent Personality Test, because Plant Friend, I want you to get thriving alongside your houseplants as quickly as possible, so I made this cutie little Plant Parent Personality Quiz that's totally free for you on my website to take the guesswork out of building your plant collection effortlessly and joyfully. After speaking to thousands of members in our community, I realized that there are about five key plant parent personalities, each one with their unique set of strengths, weaknesses, and a unique set of plants that thrive under their care. For example, a mindful plant parent, someone who wants to engage with their plants daily, use them in their morning routines. If someone gifted that plant parent a succulent and they watered it every day, that succulent would die immediately. However, that drought-resistant succulent is a perfect match for a low-key plant parent, which is someone who travels, has kids, is busy, doesn't have time to engage with their plants every day. They're looking to engage with their plants more like once a week or once every couple of weeks. In addition, obviously, to understanding your light and basic plant care that we provide on this podcast, Happy Plant Parenthood is all about discovering your personality and then picking the right house plants to go with it. It's that simple. No more stressing over your collection. So what plant parent personality type are you, plant friend? All you got to do to find out is take my free quiz on my website and let me know. You can access it at growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality. After taking the test, you'll get an email with a list of plants, podcast episodes, and planty projects that I think would light you specifically up like a full spectrum grow light. So once again, that's growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality for your free plant parent personality test results. (music) 